This is a drawing by a 16th century Italian painter, Luca Chiambasco. He's an artist who makes it very clear in certain of his drawings that the old masters that the uh, you know in the in the in the grand tradition when they started getting interested in forcefully express expressing volume they would conceive the shapes they conceive the forms as simple geometric solids that could be very clearly represented in space i'll show a, a couple other drawings of his now of course they were also interested in in the grace of the figure and that involves uh beautiful contours but always in the spirit of hogarth in other words the serpentine line of beauty and the, the serpentine line of beauty doesn't mean a flat arabesque it means a line that curves in and out of the space this illustration from Hogarth's book helps to make that clear. The line isn't just a flat thing. He, he's putting it inside this geometric solid to emphasize how this line is supposed to curl in space. If you follow the lines in this Chiambasco drawing, you can see how they're all curving around in space and how they're all structured around simple geometric solids. All the great masters, you can see this in Rembrandt very clearly too, they would conceive the forms as simple geometric solids. They didn't necessarily first draw them that way, they would conceive them that way. And then when they drew their beautiful lines, their serpentine lines, they were expressing those simple and forceful spatial movements. An even more basic fundamental in drawing is the business of one thing in front of another thing. And you notice how, particularly in master drawings, you have a definition of a very simple shape like a, a rectangle that's in front of something else or behind something else. In this Rembrandt drawing, for instance, you can see how he's building up space with very simple shapes. Here's, a, here's one thing that's in front of another thing, and both those things are represented with very, very simple shapes. But, of course, he's... Uh, He's making it all seem so graceful. With the decadence of painting in the late 18th and particularly the 19th century, these lessons were being forgotten, these basic things. And artists got more and more into pretty contours. It's a drawing by Angre. Now, Angre knew how to draw perfectly well. He was even a master draftsman. But you can see where the thing is going. The emphasis is less on the forceful expression of volume that you get so triumphantly in Chiambasco, and more on making the thing seem realistic and the emphasis on the, 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 the graceful contours. And eventually, with late 20th century classical realism or the new realism, more and more into accuracy, accurate reproduction of what they were seeing. The serpentine line of beauty is absent. To put it more exactly, the business of creating an illusion, of giving an illusion of accuracy, or you know, they 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 think of it as some kind of optical accuracy. That that doesn't really mean anything. Drawing is a uh, is a means of expressing. You're expressing something. You're expressing volumes in space. And to make that convincing, you have to do certain things which might not be exactly what you see. If you just actually copy like a photograph what you see, there can be all sorts of things that become ambiguous spatially. 
So in, in, in drawing, it's not that you have to be an accurate, you have to use the language to be expressive. And, you know, the, the, the goal in classical realism is just to give this gee whiz illusion. Oh, and somehow they think that that's better than Chiambasco. Rather than conceiving the forms in their geometric geometrical force and then expressing them beautifully. So when Cezanne came along and, and couldn't manage that kind of drawing at all, he instinctively went back to what is perfectly natural in the grand tradition, which is this simplified conception of volumes. So in his case, what was it? Spheres, cones, and cylinders, whatever it was. He never managed to get the kind of gracefulness that the old masters went for, but uh, he managed to get the forcefulness of it. There's a lot more to say about Cezanne. One of the things about Cezanne, and he's not alone in this, that he has, you know, it's so poetic and artistic and forceful in a, a very special way. But uh, just as he wasn't inventing anything with drawing, he wasn't inventing anything when it came to his marvelous use of color, it, just that he and the other early modernists were going back to, say, Giotto or going back to Raphael in, in the use of gorgeous color, getting away from the brown soupy business of illusion. I mean, people had this idea from Rembrandt and so on because you know, Rembrandt used all this dark. But if you, if you, to to get those light effects, you know, those Caravaggio-esque light effects and the the illusion. The thing is that Rembrandt is an exception in that way, in that uh, you know when when Rembrandt puts something dark down. I mean, maybe not in all cases, but you know, when he when he puts that black on that or that very dark color, it's a it's a marvelous thing in itself. It's not there. It's not only there to help create a gee whiz pop out, you know, fake illusion of light. It it also functions as its own beautiful decorative quality. The, the early modernist use of color was also a matter of going back to the old masters in the grand tradition. It was based on Cezanne that, uh, you know, that the Cubists got their idea, not, once again, not on African art. There's some paintings by Leger, by no means all of them, but there are paintings by Leger where you, you get this business of geometric solids, which might remind one a little bit of Chiambasco. But in general, Cubism is much more like Cezanne, where you have that same principle I tried to illustrate with, with the Rembrandt drawings, where you have one shape in front of another. Simple shapes, geometrical shapes, you could say. They're, they're not shapes that are trying to imitate nature in some kind of direct way. Just simple shapes, one in front of the other, or constructed as a kind of uh, uh, jagged relief. There's things coming out and things going back, so creating space, or one thing overlapping another, it's creating space. And that's what Cezanne's doing. And that, that is an aspect of this business of understanding forms in a simple geometrical way. Because even if you're thinking of something flat, just, you know, one shape in front of another, eventually it's implying something volumetric because if something's in front, it's like one face of a cube. It's nearer. Cezanne was not reinventing anything. He was going back to something that was natural and intrinsic in the problem of drawing. This is one of the great failures of classical realism. They're, <laughs> they're totally into the most decadent 19th century error, trying to reproduce, transcribe an optical impression. This is what Duchamp was complaining about when he talked about painting being too optical. Duchamp's new descending a staircase is closer to Luca Chiambasco, a 16th century 
painter than the likes of Cabanel. Check it out. I'm not saying we th should therefore paint like Duchamp. That's not the point. The point is that the, uh, the great masters were closer to Duchamp than they were to Cabanel. So if you're inspired by the great masters and Cabanel seems closer to them than Duchamp, you have something to learn. This insight is equally present in Raphael and particularly present in Raphael and already in Bellini. As, as soon as you get, uh, you get past Giotto, whose work still has something of the archaic flatness, that unsimplified thing, though Giotto gave it so much uh, psychology. As soon as, as soon as you get into the grand tradition, then this is what the artists are understanding. And uh, no matter how graceful their figures, no matter how satisfying the lines and so on, underneath it they're always expressing the movement of volumes and the basic conceptual tool for that is to is to conceive the forms to interpret the forms in simple geometrical terms in other words in terms of geometrical solids which can be represented in the way that Kian Bosco does here you can see how easy it would be to take a drawing like this and uh, you know, graceful it up and make it look more realistic. But of course, the 16th century painters, even the 17th century painters, even the eight, you know, the great 18th century painters, they never did anything as realistic as many 19th century painters, and certainly not optically illusionistically, photographically realistic, like so many, well, like all of the so-called new realists, the classical realists. There's an unbridgeable gulf between the essence of what's going on in the 16th century and this new realism. I want to make one last point about this Rembrandt drawing. Look at that arm, that sleeve over on the left. He, he's got this kind of, well, rectangular or, or rhombus representing the arm, and then he's got that circle at the end. And that circle represents the sleeve and the direction of the arm. In other words, it's coming towards us. It, it, it's all shorthand, but it adds up to an arm coming towards us. This super simple thing. And the circle that he does there is, it, it's not super connected up and all fancied up connected with the sleeve, but it doesn't matter. It expresses that. In other words, he's speaking the language of drawing.